Michael, thank you so very, very much. I've got the great pleasure to introduce our next guest, John Jono. He's a poet who has been and is of enormous influence also on so many artists. James Richards uh, kept mentioning, uh, actually, his work throughout the process of working on, uh, on this marathon. John was uh, participating in a project we did together a couple of years ago um, called Evo Still in the Lorca House in Granada. And that was actually a memory fountain, one can say. He created uh, in Lorca's, so outside Lorca's house, Douglas Gordon found the title. The show was called Evo Still, was the sort of wording of Douglas. And uh, John created a fountain where actually the poems of memory fountain, the poems could be seen under the water. It was absolutely uh, magical. Today, John would actually, uh, and he has collaborated with so many artists and poets over the decades, William Burroughs, John Ashbury, Patti Smith, Laurie Anderson, Robert Rauschenberg. Tonight, I think it will be a double memoir, and then it will also be a reading of a poem. A very, very warm welcome to John Jono. Thank you. I'm going to uh, begin with a uh, short excerpt from a long memoir piece that took place in 1963. And I wrote this piece uh, in 1987. And it's called, Where Were You in 63 When JFK Died? I was with Andy Warhol. I heard he was shot when I was downtown. Andy heard he was shot while he was walking across Grand Central Station. And I got to Andy's house at 1.30, just after he did. In the back room with the Liz Taylor and the paintings stapled up on the wall, we sat on the Tiffany couch amongst the clutter, watching the live TV coverage from Dallas. We heard Walter Cronkite say, grave and sonorous, President Kennedy died at 2 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963. Andy and I grabbed each other, hugged and hugged, pressing our bodies together, trembling. I started crying and Andy started crying, weeping big, fat tears. Intuitively, it was a reflection of our personal hopelessness. We were crying for ourselves. It was a mirror image of our naked failure. We pressed our faces together, crying into each other's tears. We kissed, and Andy sucked my tongue. It was the first time we kissed. It had the sweet taste of kissing death. It was exhilarating like when you get kicked in the head and see stars. <laughs> I didn't particularly like Kennedy, and I had never voted. But his assassination changed all that. They shot my man. <laughs> we spent the afternoon watching the live TV coverage. The telephone rang several times in the front room, and Andy answered it. His death is the best thing he's ever done, I said. Andy got a funny look on his face. Later, when we were watching Jacqueline Kennedy get off Air Force One live in Washington, wearing the blood-soaked skirt, Andy said, it's the best thing she's ever done. <laughs> Andy went downstairs several times to see his mother, who was watching it in her room on TV. And she, his mother was very upset and crying. And every, every time Andy came up, his face was drained white, drained white. <clears throat> I don't know what it means, said Andy, frightened and confused. It was, it's a bad omen, I said. JFK's death for me was a death knell in my heart. It portended what was to come, the failure of our aspirations, the 1960s dream of love and light, flower power and peace, 
ended in bad politics and our personal failures decade after decade, while the great successes and triumphs seemed trivial. Now I don't remember the last line, seemed trivial. Anyway, I'm going to skip to another memoir piece <laughs> that's called. <laughs> And this one's called The Death of William Burroughs. William died on August 2nd, 1997, Saturday at 6.30 in the afternoon from complications from a massive heart attack he'd had the day before. He was 83 years old. I was with William Burroughs when he died, and it was one of the best times I ever had with him doing Tibetan Nyingma Buddhist meditation practices, I absorbed his consciousness into my heart. It seemed like a bright white light, blinding but muted. I was the vehicle his consciousness passing through me. A gentle shooting star came in my heart and up the central channel and out the top of my head to a pure field of great clarity and bliss. It was very powerful. William Burroughs resting in great equanimity and the vast empty expanse of primordial wisdom mind. I was staying in William's house, doing my meditation practices for him, trying to maintain the good conditions and dissolve any obstacles that might be arising for him at that very moment in the bardo. I had confidence that William had a high degree of realization, but he was not totally, not completely an enlightened being lazy, alcoholic, junky William. I did not allow doubt to arise in my mind even for an instant because it would have allowed doubt to arise in William's mind. Now I had to do it for him. I'm going to skip to another part of this piece that's called What Went In to William Burroughs' Coffin with His Dead Body. On, on Tuesday morning, August 6th, 1997, James Grauerholz and Ira Silverberg came to William's house to pick out the clothes for the funeral director to put on William's dead body. The clothes were in a closet in my room, and we picked out the things that would go into William's coffin and grave accompanying him on his journey in the underworld. His favorite gun, a 38 snub nose special, fully loaded with five shots. William called it the snubby. The gun was my idea. William always said, you can never be too well armed in any situation. Of his more than 80 world-class guns, he often wore it on his belt during the day and slept with it fully loaded on his right side under the bedsheet every night for 15 years. Gray fedora, he always wore a hat when he went out, and we wanted his consciousness to feel at ease dead. <coughs> his favorite cane. A sword cane made of hickory with a light rosewood finish. Sport jacket, black with a dark green tint. We rummaged through his closet, and it was the best of his shabby clothes and smelling sweet of him. Blue jeans, the least worn ones, were the only ones clean. A red bandana, he sometimes kept one in a back pocket jockey underwear and socks, black shoes, the ones he wore when he performed. I thought the old brown ones that he wore every day because they were more comfortable. 
But James Grauholz insisted. There's an old CIA slang that says, getting a new assignment is getting new shoes. <laughs> White shirt, we'd bought it in a men's store in Beverly Hills in 1981 on the Red Night Tour. It was his best shirt. All the others were a bit ragged. And even though it had become tight, He'd lost a lot of weight, and we thought it would fit. Necktie, blue, hand-painted by William. Moroccan vest, green velvet with a gold brocade trim, given him by Brian Geisen 25 years before. In his lapel buttonhole, the rosette of the French government's commandeur des arts et lettres, and the rosette of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, honors which William very much appreciated. A gold coin in his pants pocket, a gold 19th century Indian head $5 piece, symbolizing all wealth. He would have enough money to buy his way in the underworld. His eyeglasses in his outside jacket pocket. A ballpoint pen. He was a writer and sometimes wrote longhand. A joint of really good grass. <laughs> Junk. Just before the funeral, Grand Hart slipped a small white paper packet into William's pocket. Nobody's going to bust him, said Grant. <laughs> William, bejeweled with all his adornments, was traveling in the underworld. I kissed him, an early LP album of Us Together, 1974, was called Biting Off the Tongue of a Corpse. I kissed him on the lips, but I didn't do it. And I should have. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do one more poem. And this is called, It Doesn't Get Better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any more fabulous. And as bad as it is, it does not get any better. Stuck in a traffic jam and the scenery is beautiful, irritating gusts of boredom, and on the radio is playing. If you don't like my oceans, don't swim in my seas. You can't hurt me, cause storms can't hurt the sky. Sugar skulls and long necklaces of rotting human skulls of lawyers, police officers, and judges, the triumph over abuse and injustice. Fat chance, ringed alarm, I could not save you. You are addicted to anger and complaining. When you got hepatitis, everything looks yellow. My anger ate the goose that laid the golden eggs, thick bacon and a little something sweet. And the most surprising change is being the god of your enemies. The eagles fly below us. The illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable. When you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you've lost whatever it is you believed or invented or imprinted or scarred by, unthinkable loss, delusion inside, delusion inside, delusion. Everything is delusion, including wisdom. And then there's the illusions that make life bearable, the illusions that make 
life bearable, the illusions that make life bearable. I'm here to do whatever is your pleasure. Empty words gone without a trace. All I had to do was get through it all. I had to do was get through it all. I had to do was get through it. You can't win. You can't break even. And you can't even quit the game. And happily, very soon, I will remember nothing. The sand is snow, a hurricane in a drop of cum. You will find your true love in the end. You will find your true love in the end. When you die, you will find your true love in your mind. When you die, you will find your true mind. In the darkest night is the brightest light, clear, unlocatable, emptiness awareness. Thank you.